Good job. Oh, that was loud. Hey, Sam. What's up, boo? Uh, uh, okay, before we get into our next panel, which I know you guys are all excited about, I'm going to throw it to a quick video. Enjoy. Okay, you guys. This is it. No turning back now. You've got about two options. One, you build yourself the box. Two, you get Lori Bream on the phone ASAP. All right, I'll see you back at the house. Uh, ah, Yuraki-san. Arigato. Gozaimasu. I like what you're doing with the foliage. I like your uh, rock to bamboo ratio. Arigato for all of the greenery. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. I mean, I do not get why anyone would use spaces over tabs. I mean, why not just use Vim over Emacs? <laughs> I do use Vim over Emacs. Oh, God help us. I just, I don't think this is going to work. I mean, like, what? Right, we're going to bring kids into this world with that over the head? That's not really fair to them, don't you think? Kids? We haven't even slept together. And guess what? It's never going to happen now, because there is no way I'm going to be with someone who uses spaces over tabs. But guess what, Winnie? That ain't ever going to happen now, girl. That ain't ever going to happen now, sister. There is no way I am going to let someone who uses spaces over tabs anywhere near this. Richard. Wow, OK. Goodbye. Richard, 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 I am totally lost. I'm not the CEO. There is no CEO. Because apparently, Jack's empty fucking chair is a better choice than I am. Say what you will about the chair, but at least it never told me to build the fucking box. True. Compared to Richard, it's a lot sturdier. And it has a lot less of Barker's ass rubbed all over it. Yeah, Barker's ass at least isn't on the chair's face. You mean the headrest? Maybe it wasn't brown when it started. Oh, you really took this too far, I think. I don't know, guys. I can sit there and watch them do that to you. I saw this nature documentary where a bison fought a lion to protect the rest of the herd. Um, it didn't work. The, the lion uh, tore into the bison and then laid waste to the herd, but what courage. You're like one of those priests who lit themselves on fire to protest the Vietnam War. You're like the Secret Service agent who dives on the president and, and catches a bullet. And the president still dies, but he dies slower because your body stopped the bullet, not from entering him, but from entering him at a rate that would have killed him instantly. OK, thank you for that, Jared. Roar. <laughs> Boy, it is chilly. Good thing I brought this sweet jizz jacket. You look like a douchebag. You look like the starting center on your high school varsity celibacy team. Like the starting center on the varsity virginity squad. You look like a Ukrainian rap star who made his first hundred. Hey, don't forget to carb up. It's leg day. We work out doing the squats. You're looking at the past, present, and possibly future CEO of Pine Piper. Ah! <laughs> oh, that is oh, that, uh, <laughs> My captain. Oh, captain, my captain. Rise up and hear the bells. Rise up for you. The flag is flung. For you, the bugle trills. You make me so proud, I feel like the whole night sky is inside my chest. I just want to memorize this moment. I am so proud of you, I could puke. God darn it. Gosh, in heaven, and I love you. All right, dismissed. <laughs> you can clap. It's not... I mean, you don't have to. Don't feel pressure, but... Just a little awkward silence there. All right, let's get to it. Please welcome to the stage HBO's Mike Judge and our moderator, Anthony Ha. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks for uh, joining us again at Disrupt, Mike. Thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, a very special thank you for making it a million, a million times easier to explain to my relatives, like, what I do for a living. Um, <laughs> I really appreciate that. So I want to go back to when Silicon Valley first premiered. And I remember 
watching the first episode and laughing a bunch, but also being like, normal people are not going to get this. This is <laughs> totally going to die. I was wrong. What, what <laughs> oh, made geez. you feel confident that this is a show that America would get? Well, I mean, you know, uh, well, I just thought it was incredibly good. So, no, I, I, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not really, especially back when we were first starting, I'm not a tech insider. I mean, I worked as an engineer a long time ago in Silicon Valley, but um, so I, and even then I felt like an outsider, so I, I always kind of approached it from an outsider's kind of point of view. So, and you know, the people that I pitched it to at HBO and the people working on it, you know, these were all uh, non-tech people. So it's always, that's always been the, you know, we were very conscious of not trying to make it too inside and, and have it be more about, you know, just a, a character who's socially awkward, who suddenly has all this light shined on him and all this money at play and all those kind of things. So tr trying to make it relatable that way. So when you pitched it to HBO, did they get it right away or did they have some skepticism? Uh, there was some skepticism. I mean, I, you know, I had done this movie Office Space, which, you know, a while back, but it, you know, I mean, that's sort of a similar, it's like, oh, you're going to make a movie about a bunch of people in cubicles who are miserable. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, this at least, at least there's some people getting rich and <laughs> a little bit of excitement. So, uh, it, it does seem like it's office space was a much bleaker uh, movie and like Silicon Valley, there's like a, a sliver of hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Silicon Valley is a little more hopeful than office space was, but uh, yeah, I mean, they were, they actually originally came to me uh, about an idea about uh, video game developers, and I don't really know that world much at all, so I, I said I wasn't interested in doing that, but what about something like this? And that's, that's kind of how it started. Um, so I want to talk about the research that you guys have done, which included coming to Disrupt first right. kind of secretly for, for research, and then you came on stage. What was that first, um, that first visit like? I mean, was it pretty much what you expected? Um, I mean, it, it was more than I expected, better than I expected. It was very eye-opening. I mean, for us, you know, we'd, we'd shot the pilot, and the way, you, the way it works in TV, you, the pilot's first episode, so you shoot that. If they like it, they green light the series. So they green lit the series, and uh, Alec Berg, who's a co-showrunner and writer with me, came on board, and you know, we were sitting there in the office just kind of going, uh, hi we got to make all this stuff up. I don't, what, <laughs> we don't even know what these people do, really. I mean, we know it's people programming. They're building this thing. And so we just started doing a ton of research. I didn't even know tech, what TechCrunch Disrupt was. And then we found out about, uh, there's a Launchpad L LA is an incubator in LA. And this woman, Jamie, told us about Startup Battlefield. And I heard that, like, Startup Battlefield. That's <laughs> like, like a war. That's great. That's what we need. We need, like, you know, we need some drama. And uh, so coming up here, and yeah, we came up and just sort of spied on you guys here. We, we uh, just kind of walked around and, and we watched the whole startup battlefield and, and it's just perfect for our show. Um, so one of the, you mentioned Alec, your co-showrunner, and one of the things he mentioned about Disrupt is you guys actually shot a little bit of, of footage here. And so when people watch those episodes of the show, and particularly they sort of complained about how dude heavy some of that footage was you were, you guys were like nope that's that's actual disrupt um so i'm yeah. curious i mean do you feel like there are things that we could be doing better to you know oh for diversity yeah for diversity um, exactly yeah, um it seems like I, okay so that was 2013 when i came here uh, it seems like it's there's been a huge push for diversity you know which is which is great um i mean even just backstage there was the um what is it called the girls uh uh, I'm forgetting the name, but the 16-year-old girl who did a app that recognizes symptoms of Parkinson's and I oh mean, wow, you know, okay, uh, incredible stuff. But um, yeah, we—I I actually was walking around with a Canon 5D, just shooting stuff myself, not, never thinking it would be in the show, just to kind of show ex, extras casting and people like, okay, this is what they look like, you know, and, and yeah, it was about. 85% dudes in that <laughs> audience shot, and uh, yeah, I think Alec was talking to a, a 
high up COO of a very big company and she said, you know, that audience shot was kind of sexist and said, no, that's actually the real audience. I mean, you know, when you do satire, you take what's there and exaggerate it, but we didn't really have to exaggerate <laughs> too much. Cause yeah, I, I mean, part of the reason to bring that up was just reading that quote was <laughs> pretty tough for me, <laughs> but, you know, totally fair. And I do think, I mean, one of the things about the show itself is that the main cast is not exclusively, but largely yeah. male, largely white slash Asian. And as you said, you know, the industry itself is trying to change the way people think about engineers, change the way people think about tech. Do you think the show should reflect that too? Yeah, and I think we, we are. We have a little bit. But, um, you know, at the beginning, I, I didn't want to come off as sort of phony Hollywood pandering. And I wanted to try to make it pretty realistic. And, I, I mean, all the research I did, it was like very high percentage of male. I mean, I went into a uh, pretty big room at Google where the, all the programmers were and I counted two women out of I don't know how many and so I mean you know when you do satire you're making fun of it so that was our way of just kind of poking fun at the world I, I didn't anticipate just how kind of charged up this issue was <laughs> like I I mean I had done a show King of the Hill for 13 seasons and in, in the entire 13 years nobody ever complained that there weren't any women working in propane and uh, <laughs> so I was kind of like, well, this is tech and it's all guys and we'll just do, you know, and uh, <laughs> boy, I, I mean, but I get it. I, I mean, there's, you know, propane, there's not a lot of money and power in it. So, <laughs> so nobody, nobody cares about poor old propane. But um, once tech moves into propane, then we'll, we'll see. Yeah, after this bubble bursts, it's <laughs> <laughs> no, I. So you, so you, um, you know, used to work in Silicon Valley mumbledy mumble decades ago um, and <laughs> you 80 years ago that's right um, so I'm curious like when you came back to do the research for the show did it feel like okay this is just a continuing version of what I experienced or was it pretty different um, I think it's a continuing version it's it's different um, in a lot of ways I think the characters are kind of the same but um, definitely the landscape has changed I mean when I worked here in the late 80s uh, it was mostly, it was kind of hardware was the thing. So it was, you know, and the barrier to entry to, to a startup was, was a little higher because you had to, it just took more money. You couldn't just get, you know, three or four people who program and build an app. Because, um, and, you know, God, I'm old. Uh, <laughs> there were no cell phones and, you know. Uh, but you look great, so. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. thank you. Um, clean living. Uh, but, yeah, no, it was... Um, it's, I feel like, again, like the, I think the characters are kind of similar. I, I think the characters that I put in office space, had they been born 20 years later, could easily be in a startup, you know? And, um, and there's also just, uh, it's kind of just more money in, involved. I mean, I remember back then thinking the rent was high and I, I had an apartment in East Palo Alto because it's all I could afford. And then thinking like, well, I just can't get any more expensive and it just, kept just more and more money flooding into this place. Well, one of the other things um, you said about Silicon Valley and this profile uh, about the show in The New Yorker, which is great, and everyone should read it if they, they haven't already, um, was you said that you think that one of the conflicts right now is between sort of the libertarian camp and the, the hippie values of Silicon Valley. Does that seem like a new phenomenon to you? Um, I think that was still kind of going on a little bit when I was here, um, when I was working in tech. Uh, I think the hippies will always win, no matter what. Wait, <laughs> really? Okay. No, I mean, I, <laughs> I, well, I think what, what was interesting to me is that, you know, there's a lot of money at play and a lot of companies competing for, you know, billions of dollars and users and all this stuff. Um, and in Wall Street, they just kind of, you know, like, it's like the old school, like, we're hedge fund guys, we get rich and whatever. Here it's sort of shrouded in this, you know, we're making the world a better place, we're doing, you know, and a lot of these apps are. Um, but it's just kind of a, f for, you know, for comedy, it's just kind of a funny thing to make fun of. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think that comes out of hippie culture, ultimately, I mean, which isn't a bad thing. I, th I think uh, there's a lot 
more attention on just charity and all this kind of stuff here than you would have in, you know, in New York in the 80s. I, do, I mean, to be fair, I do think that you guys have now made it a lot harder for a startup to come on stage and say we make the world a better place. <laughs> so, you know, mostly thank you for that. <laughs> well, uh, it was, yeah, I mean, it's funny, like when we did our, uh, we, we had hired the writers and we took them to Launchpad LA actually. And so this is, they had seen the pilot, so we'd done the pilot and which had all that stuff in it and they bring out their first startup to talk to us it's five guys uh one east indian um, it's like the same ratio that we, and they did their pitch it was sort of a thing that would combine all your music into one thing and and then at the end of it they said and we're making the world a better place and uh, it was basically exactly our group and the pilot so do you i mean do you think that when, when we talk about this idea of, you know, dressing up this usually a for-profit business idea in this rhetoric of like, man, like, you know, this sort of idealistic hippie rhetoric, do you think that actually is a good thing or would you almost, I think at least, so I, I live in New York and I think there are definitely some people there who almost feel like they'd rather see it just be more honest and be like, yeah, man, we're just going to make a ton of money. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I suppose it, it doesn't matter that much. I mean, I think it's, it, it, it's, it's just funnier when you yeah, it's it just up. funny. I mean, like I, I d coming from Hollywood, where which is a little more kind of in the middle, I guess. Like you don't, I don't think you would hear, you know, J.J. Abrams say, you know, like why are you making Star Wars? Or because I want to make the world a better place and improve people's lives. And in, I, you know, but he does like, have to start by like, saying, I love I Star Wars. I want to make a kick-ass movie, and I love Star Wars. You know, it's not. Right. It's kind of a different. Uh, approach so like you know it's just something fun to make fun of i don't think anybody's really doing anything awful by saying that you know so going back to the research i mean as the show has gone on you guys have built what seems like a pretty incredible network of, of people who consult on the show including yeah. de costello the, uh, the the former um ceo of twitter and i mean a whole bunch of people right yeah we've uh, yeah we've been very lucky to have uh so many great consultants and, and people reach out to us and tell us great stories. Um, yeah, early on, like I say, when Alec and I were just sitting in the office going, what, what do we do here? We, we got to learn about this world. Like, we don't know enough. We had a guy uh, who's still on the show, Jonathan Doton, who was just immensely helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, that just informed a lot of what, what we wrote about. Um, and now we have, yeah, Dick Costello, right after he left Twitter came and would actually sit in the writer's room with us two days a week. It was awesome. Um, yeah, so it's, that's been nice. Does that, as you, I mean, and I think so there's people who work full time on the show. There's also, it seems like you kind of do like a tour where you kind of talk to different CEOs and see different companies. Yeah. As you've done that, I mean, and, and people, it seems like, and Silicon Valley in general has sort of embraced the show, it seems. Does that make it harder to do like really biting satire? Um, I was asked that before. I, I don't think so because the kind of people that we've become friends with tend to not take themselves very seriously. So, I mean, you know, and the ones that do, we don't really end up, you know, talking too much. Uh, I mean, Dick Costello, for example, was in our show playing himself, talking to Jeremy Stoppelman about how he bought a bad vineyard or someone sold him a bad vineyard. I mean, so it's <laughs> like, you know, I mean, we... You know, that's, and he, you know, that's pretty self-deprecating, I think, you know. Yeah. He well, didn't I'm, buy a bad vineyard, by the way. Uh, I do think one of the other things that's, like, happened that's kind of weird is that as the show has become popular, you know, in the industry, is that then you actually get people who are inspired by Silicon Valley. And I'm curious, what, as a satirist especially, what is that like for you? That's great. I mean... When I did Office Space, I've had so many people come up to me and tell me it inspired them to quit their job. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's nice to do something that might inspire people to get a job uh, or to do a startup. I mean, yeah, I, I have heard that a little bit, and it's great. Uh, um, I mean, I, I, I love it. I think it's, it's, uh, it's a good, it, you know, I think it feels good to build something and do something your own way. I, I can relate to it, so... Right. <clears throat> I mean, that, I guess that does seem to be the difference between Silicon Valley and office space, where fundamentally in office space, you were just like, this is corrupt and terrible. In Silicon Valley, you're like, <laughs> there are a lot of dumb things, but fundamentally, you don't think it's as screwed up. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're writing a show about these characters. If, if we were completely believing that what they did was, 
was bad or stupid or whatever, you wouldn't want to watch it. I mean, I, in real life, I would like these guys, and you know, I would want to, you know, I think I like the characters. So yeah, ultimately, you want to root for them, and and uh, yeah, I think it's, I, I like that part of the world, the startup part of it. <clears throat> So I think you know one of the things we have to talk about is the next season, season four of Silicon Valley. Um, so you guys are writing the next season right now? Yeah, we're we're trying to write the next season. <laughs> uh, Difficult. Yeah, we're about halfway through, but we've been known to throw stuff out and just start over again quite a bit. So. So what, what can you tell us about what's coming? <laughs> Everything, right? Well, I'll just tell you the whole thing. Um, I can't tell one, you what I don't know two. yet. Uh, we're still. Um, well. There's a possibility you might see one of the stupidest apps ever invented might be unveiled this season. <laughs> okay. um, there's also, I don't know, we may even come back to TechCrunch Disrupt. You never know. There's, we've, we've talked about it. So. Yeah, do, you need, do you need some more actors to yeah, come we, on stage? And... <laughs> yeah, this is an audition right here. So. <laughs> right, suddenly I just got a lot more nervous. <laughs> Well, so, I mean, one of the things people talk about the show is it does have this kind of ripped from the headlines quality. Um, is there any news this year that you have felt has been particularly oh. interesting or promising from that perspective? Boy, it keep, it's, it's hard to keep up with, and sometimes we get ahead of it. Like, like when we were here in 2013, we had already shot the pilot. So the pilot was already in the can. And we had that thing, Nip Alert, which was supposed to be a dumb app. And, and then in the hackathon, these Australian douchebag guys came up with something called tit stare, which kind of brought to the headlines this, you know, the sexism and misogyny in the tech world. And so it looked like when we came out in 2014, we were making fun of that, but we actually did that obnoxious app before the real obnoxious app. So sometimes we get ahead of it. But uh, yeah, there's, um, I want, we, I want to do something with tech protesters, the, the okay. anti-tech people, because I think that's, you know, if we're going to make fun of the tech people, I think we should make fun of them also. And we actually shot something that didn't make it in, kind of based on the vomiting on the Yahoo bus thing. And because, uh, I mean, you know, that, I, I think that's sort of misguided. And, you know, these people are just trying to get to their jobs to keep the websites alive that the same people protesting are probably going to use to check the, you know, all the social media. So, yeah, I want to do something with that. I'm trying to think if there's anything else recently. They're probably, I can't remember. Well, I mean, I guess one thing I, d I didn't want to ask about because maybe it's just the one that I find the most fascinating and because you did have a Peter Thiel-ish character early on in the show is, I mean, what, what did you follow the, the news about Peter Thiel kind of coming after Gawker at all? Yeah, we, um, actually we might do something related to that. Uh, yeah, that, I, I, I don't know all the facts. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I mean, look, I'm not crazy about the idea of billionaires controlling the media, but then again, I think if Gawker hadn't posted a, you know, a sex tape without people's permission, they might still be in business. <laughs> right. <laughs> Probably didn't help that they posted a headline that said, Peter Thiel is totally gay. I mean, it's not, it, if they start taking down the New York Times or Washington Post, I might start to worry a little bit more, but... Oh, so I think we're almost out of time. So the last thing I wanted to ask about was just how did you guys come up with the like disrupt dick joke at the end of season one? <laughs> that, that was, uh, well, when we were first starting to write the show, I just had this idea that I wanted to have a kind of a beautiful mind moment, like in the movie where he's talking about the way people <laughs> separate in a bar, but maybe sillier or something. And I, I was looking for something there. And... Okay, I'm going to get a little blue here. Uh, one of the writers was uh, completely separately talking about an argument he had with his roommate or a discussion about, like, where the guy said, like, no, you could actually jerk off four guys if they were tip to tip. And Alec overheard that and came to me and said, hey, I think I might have the, uh, the thing you're looking for here. And then we just started. It was, I remember it was Alec, myself, and this guy, Dan O'Keefe, in the writer's room on a dry erase board going like, well, no, it would actually be the dick to floor distance and then the angle, like all those conversations that are in there we were having and actually drawing on the dry erase board and just juvenile. So the math is completely stuff. solid. Yeah, yeah, well then this guy Vanith, who's a Stanford grad student, I think he's at IBM now, brilliant guy, he 
I just said, hey, can you give us some stuff to put on the dry erase board? And he wrote a thing that's now published <laughs> that's like the, uh, the mathematical, you know, the most efficient way to jerk off 500 men. And I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> but and it's, on it's, that note, it's in the, uh, you, can, you can look it up. I think I, it's, it's on Twitter. And uh, boy, yeah, we, we went deep into that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, give it up one more time for Mike Judge. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks.